Hi, this is Natalie Hoffman of FlyingFreeNow.com, and you're listening to the Flying Free Podcast, a support resource for women of faith looking for hope and healing from hidden emotional and spiritual abuse. Welcome to episode 40 of the Flying Free Podcast. Today, I'm excited to have with me Megan Cox, a pastoral counselor and founder of the Give Her Wings nonprofit ministry to abuse survivors. And more recently, she founded the the Give Her Wings Academy, which seeks to educate and equip people helpers. And that is what we are going to talk about today. Welcome, Megan. Thank you, Natalie. I am so happy to be here. You know, I just love you to pieces. I love flying free. Um, Give Her Wings has always done our best to support your ministry at, because it's vital. And what you do is vital. And the training that you are bringing forth and the help that you are giving people is just beyond priceless. So, of course, I'm thrilled to be here. Always love when you and I get to talk. Oh, thanks, Megan. I feel the same way. I feel like we could just, we, if we start talking, we may never stop. So, and then the transcript is going to cost me a lot of money. So <laughs> that's we can dive right in. Yeah. Whenever you're ready, we can just dive. <laughs> okay. Well, today we have a great uh, topic. We are going to be actually talking to people helpers. So if you are a survivor and you've actually gotten enough, you know, through your healing process and you're actually thinking about being a people helper, this will really help you and be beneficial. And, but if you're still kind of in the thick of your situation, but you would like to have kind of a go-to resource that you could recommend to other people helpers who might be working with you, maybe your pastor or an elder at your church or a friend, you could link them to this podcast and it will help them and support them in helping you and others like you. And then we're going to also be having, we will also have some links to special resources that people who listen to this podcast can access in the show notes. So to find those show notes, all you need to do, if you're listening to this on your phone, is go to flyingfreenow.com. Up in the menu bar, there's a link called podcasts. Click on that link and go to podcast episode 40, and you will see the, show, the links to the um, extra resources there. So what we're going to be doing today is talking about a problem that both Megan and I have seen. Megan and I have worked with literally hundreds of women of faith in abusive relationships, abuse of all kinds, physical abuse, emotional abuse, spiritual abuse, financial abuse. One of the main problems that really grieves us, excuse me, is that when these women go to their churches for help, instead of getting the kind of help and support they need, they're actually being, it's called re-abuse. They're actually being re-abused in different ways. And that's what we're going to address today. We're going to address that problem of re-abuse, what it is that's, you know, where's that coming from? Why are they experiencing these things? What's the result to their lives? And then we'll talk about some solutions towards the end. So Megan, what are you seeing as far as the problem of um, re-abuse? What do you, why do you think this is happening to these women? You know, for those of you listening, Natalie and I both really started and founded these ministries that we run because of this very problem. Um, I was re-victimized by not just one church, but several churches. I know Natalie has a similar story. And like she said, we've heard hundreds of women who have gone through this very same thing. And unfortunately, a lot of the times when women are re-victimized by their churches, they never return to church again. And we actually, you know, I don't blame them for when I hear the stories of what they've gone through, I don't blame them. And so the whole reason that we even started Give Her Wings was because we wanted to be the church to women who can't set foot in their churches anymore because of the abuse that they suffered um, once they got there. And statistics have shown that very often the re-victimization that women experience at the hands of their families, churches, friends, loved ones can cause more PTSD symptoms than the original abuse in their abusive marriages. And um, it's heartbreaking because it's been so taboo for so long. And we're just now seeing, of course, with the Me Too movement and the Church Too movement and all of, of these movements that are coming to the forefront, now it seems like 
ministers and pastors and churches are starting to say, oh, maybe we do need to know something about this. Maybe we do need to do something about this. Um, so I think that sadly there's a great lack of education when it comes to abuse. It is its own entity. Um, I think that for a long time, um, churches have wanted to kind of sweep the topic of abuse into, fit it somehow into just some sort of a general sin problem, but it's not a general sin problem. It's, it's an, you know, just a horrible, horrible affront to the living God. And so education is one of the, the greatest needs for pastors and ministers. And I know you and I have a lot to talk about, about, you know, what we would like to see in churches. Some of the women that we have served, their faith has been hanging by a thread. I, the only reason that I can figure that they still believe in God is perseverance of the saints, really, because um, they have been so bruised emotionally by the people who were supposed to be be there to catch them. That is our calling as a church is to serve the widow and the orphan, the downtrodden and the oppressed. And um, I think that we have been failing in that. And I'm really hoping that the tide is turning soon. Well, and you can see these, you know, these churches that are um, abandoning these women, they're they are well-meaning. I mean, they they seem to want to help other kinds of people in need, like you know, they will reach out to people who are dying of cancer. They'll reach yeah. out to people who've lost, who've lost their spouse. You could be a woman whose spouse has died and mm -hmm. you will get all kinds of love and support. But there is um, this stigma, or you could even be a woman who, um, well, in some churches, you could be a woman whose husband maybe cheated on you n numerous times and, right. and then abandon you and divorce you. And then you would be supported and cared for. But it's like, mm -hmm. so it's okay if someone cheats on you, but it's not okay if they're abusing you in other ways or hurting yeah, and you. And that's really, way. yeah, that's some sort of a, a, a paradigm that we seem to have adopted theologically where, um, you know, we'll help people who, who can't get free, you know? Um, but if she's strong and chooses to get free, we're not going to help her. And it's a really, really strange phenomenon. Um, and it's really too bad. I, I wrote a blog post four or five years ago, um, about the difference between when my parents died in a car accident 25 years ago, and we, we received a thousand dinners that we couldn't even finish and so many flowers that we had to donate them to the local nursing home. But when I left my ex-husband, I was branded, I was shunned, I was ostracized by those very same people because I chose to bring my children to safety. And, um, and it was horrible. It was horrible. I doubted myself. I doubted my faith. I thought maybe God didn't love me. Yeah. Um, and that's what we see. And that is a travesty in yeah. the kingdom of God um, for the church to say, you know what? you chose to leave. And so we're not, we're going to, we're not going to support you. And then we might even harass you and well-intended. Yes, it could be well-intended. It might be something to do with, um, cause I don't want this to be an indictment on the church. Cause we go to church, we love church. Um, and we love the bride of Christ at the same time. Um, I think it just looks so messy to people sometimes. And if they're hearing an abusive man, who's very charming and um, very, you know, involved in service. And he's saying, um, oh, it was all her. Um, and then she's very bravely saying, it wasn't me. I didn't do that. And she looks like she's doubting herself and she feels crazy, which is all due to all the different types of abuse within that marriage. Mm -hmm. Then they just don't know what to believe. Yeah. And so it might be easier to just say, you know, um, we're just not going to deal with this because we're not equipped in this area. We don't know what to believe. And maybe we can pick up the pieces later and kind of help them. But also, I think um, we've been pretty stuck in a theology of um, 
holding marriage above and beyond the well-being of God's children and the right mm-hmm. to life even. Mm-hmm. And um, so we have that going on. Um, I think that people are starting to wake up and, and that they're starting to say, you know what? Um, I think God values this woman's life more than he upholds this institution. You know, after all, Jesus died for people, not for institutions. Mm -hmm. Um, He, you know, in every generation, there seems to be something, um, (laughs) something that, that we are hyper-focused on, Um, you know, in the, um, in Jesus' time, what were they focused on? You know, they, they had this whole thing about the Sabbath, like, are you working on the Sabbath? Don't heal on the Sabbath. He did this on the Sabbath. What about the ox and the Sabbath? You know, and that was their whole thing. <laughs> and um, I think with, I mean, this is just my my little personal theory, and I've kind of thought a lot about this, but, you know, we, we ushered in, focus on the family, 50 or 60 years ago, we've ushered in all of these you know, in these incredible reformations to help hold marriages and families together, and we overcorrected. And yeah. as a human race, we're great at overcorrecting. We tend to do that like crazy. And so we overcorrect, and then things become idols. And then things go wrong because we've overcorrected. We have this idol, marriage has become an idol. And don't get me wrong, because, you know, I, my husband and I uphold marriage. In fact, we uphold it so much that we don't believe that abusive marriages are covenantal marriages. I mean, that's how high we hold marriage. Yeah. Um, and so it, you know, it becomes this idol that we have and then, um, then things fall apart and we don't know what to do because we can't really see outside of that and we need a reframe and, you know, God's people, we need reframes all over the place and all the time because we haven't figured it all out. And so having that humility, which I would define humility as being the ability to say, I am not doing this right. This is not working for me. We have a problem. This isn't working for us. Our way isn't best. Maybe there's a better way, a higher way, God's way. And being able to say, I need to read something about this. Maybe I need to look outside of just the authors from my denomination or my seminary. Maybe I need to listen to people. Maybe I need to listen to stories. Uh, Maybe I need to focus less on being right and fixing things and being more concerned about being kind and showing mercy because that's how God is. Right. I think, yes, I think the bottom line as Christians for us is, is that we are loving people the way Christ loves us. And when mm-hmm. you, if you are a, a, an individual who is uh, condemned, you know, looking a woman in the eyes and saying, well, you don't know God because mm-hmm. that woman is going to file for divorce from an abusive husband and you don't want to believe that you so badly don't want to believe that man is abusive because he's so nice to you that mm-hmm. is a problem that that's not, that's a lack of the foundation behind that is not love it's not built i would even say naturally that there's a lot of arrogance there i mean what you're saying is i haven't experienced that so it didn't happen Right. And exactly. That's pretty, exactly. that's a pretty arrogant statement, you know? Exactly. Well, and to even, exactly. To even say to someone, you do or don't know God when you don't even know that. Yeah. An elder said that to me, an elder who mm-hmm. doesn't even know me personally, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. So, I mean, his, mo- oh, sorry. My whole thing felt my whole podcast set up. <laughs> um, here. He didn't, the only information he had about me was, you know, what my husband, what my ex-husband had told him and what he had observed about me at a state in my life when I was, you know, attempting to get free and really asserting myself, um, rather than just, you know, hiding and trying to make everything, you know, seem like it was okay on the outside. Um, and so it can look one way to, one of the things I've wrote in my book is that 
a lot of times the victim will want, will get to a place in her life where she is ready to get out. And she sees that they're the only way out is to either commit suicide or to mm-hmm. commit murder <laughs> or to <laughs> hopefully she went to right. that or to, you know, file for divorce. And whereas her, um, abuser, and this could go both ways. It could be the man who's the uh, victim and the woman is usually the, the one who's perpetrating the abuse on the other person wants to stay in the marriage and wants the marriage to work. Why? Because that's where, where their control is. If, if they lose control of that person, then they, they've, you know, lost their game, right? So they're going to want to keep the marriage intact. So their goal, the abuser's goal and the church's goal line up. And that is one of the reasons why the church ends up re-abusing the woman again, because the church is actually aligned with the abuser at that point in time. And the focus is on the marriage. So if the focus was more on the loving this man and, and this woman loving both of them in the ways that they each need to be loved, that would mean being honest, telling the truth. And it would also mean, mean acknowledging that this marriage may not be able to be saved because a marriage is two people coming together and working cooperatively. It's not one person power overing and control power overing. Is that a word? It is now. It's not one person power taking power over and controlling another human being in a, in an abusive fashion. That's not a marriage. That's a, that's concu. That's being a concubine or a slave. I hear that that from women who say, I felt like a prostitute. And I think that we need to hear that, that we need to hear their voices when they say, I feel like a concubine or I feel like a prostitute. And, you know, I would even go a step further, Natalie. And I would say, not only might their marriage not be savable, it might have died a very long time ago. Right. Um, and that's something, you know, if, you know, like you said, you just said something so wise about the, the abuser's agenda and the church's agenda being aligned in that moment. And now mm-hmm. she is the outcast or he, um, you know, usually it's female, but it can also be male. Megan, both you and I um, have... But I have been divorced and now we're both remarried to health and we have healthy marriages now. And I would say that my, and I'm sure you would say this too, our former marriages were a reflection mm-hmm. of what the enemy does to the, a child of God. They accuse, they badger, they um, criticize, they cut down um, and they lie. Okay. So, and, and our current marriages I would say represent more of what Christ is Christ in to the other person. Christ represents love and hope and peace. He builds up, he encourages, he sets them free. That is, a, and that's so one, one of the things that I heard a lot when I was um, married is, well, you know, marriage is a representation of Christ in the church. So if you get a divorce, then you're not bringing glory to God because and inside my head, I was thinking, my marriage is so not a representation of Christ and the church. Yeah. I hope my marriage was not a representation of Christ and the church because that would be a really black mark on Christ's character. Yeah, it's blasphemous. It's really, it's it blasphemous. Really, yeah, a, a glorifying, a God-glorifying marriage like the ones you and I gratefully have now is a whole different world. It's life-giving. And yeah. out of good theology should come good fruit. And so, you know, it, I, it, in my mind, I cannot imagine like the universal church as a whole saying, oh my goodness, we need to repent as a people. What have we done? What have we done to these women? What have we done to marriages? Um, I can't imagine that happening, but I still hope that it will happen. Yeah. Um, because God cares. He does care about the individual. Yeah. And marriage, you know, he, he did say to the Pharisees, I meant for you to be one when I created you that way, you know, in the Garden of Eden. I, I meant for you guys to be one. But I almost hear him say, but obviously that didn't happen. So here's da, 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 you know. Yeah. Um, so I think that he grieves that. Sometimes as humanity, as humankind, we can't pull that off because we've married somebody who's not willing to try to do that with us, you know, and you can't force, 
your spouse to, and then women are put in this impossible situation of, you know, well, it's kind of, it's almost like they put the job of salvation on the woman and submission. So how those two fit together? No, they can't. I mean, that's just logical. At the same time, you know, even further than that, theologically, it's not our job. We can't save anybody. People are drawn by the Holy Spirit. And for us to give control or power or let our husband control us, um, to me, that's disobedient. When when God says, be controlled by the Holy Spirit, that means be controlled by the Holy Spirit, not another human being. Um, So there's that, you know. I always, I always thought that your authority was God's voice in your life, you know, mm-hmm. so God would speak through your authority and that yeah. creates all kinds of problems then when, when you're married, it also creates problems then in your church. Cause if your church people are telling you, your church leaders are telling you, you need to do this, this, and this, you think that it's God, mm-hmm. but here's the other thing. We we're seeing a lack of trust in the Holy Spirit's ability to actually work oh. in individual Christians lives. The yes. Holy Spirit, I, when I filed for divorce, I 150% know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God was directing me to do that, or I wouldn't have done it. And it took four years for me to come to that place where I finally did, you know, where I was finally, in fact, when I made that decision, I was on my face on the floor of a hotel room saying, I'm sorry, God, that I have not obeyed you in this. But now I'm going to. And two days later, I went in and, fi- and filed. So, yeah. that, so um, and, and, and it was a huge burden lifted because I felt that God would, had been trying to get me to do this for a long time. But I was listening to the voices of all these people around me. Now, that might be, you know, if you're a pastor or an elder listening to this, you might be thinking, whoa, that's not, you know, she's a deceived person. No, I have the Holy Spirit living inside of me. And you need to trust God enough to know that the Holy Spirit can direct my life in my circumstances and may direct it differently than he may direct your life and your circumstances. And until we are able to open our eyes and, and acknowledge that God is bigger than our little brains and our little paradigms, <laughs> and so we, it does, it takes, it takes an extreme amount of humility. And here's the thing. Here's the other thing though. Let's say that I was wrong. Let's say I really was deluded and deceived and I made the wrong choice and, you know, and I fell down the slippery slope into sin. And by the way, right now, my relationship with God is, is more, it's deeper and better than ever, even though it looks very different now than it did yeah. prior to this whole thing from ha- that happened. But let's say that I had been delusional. What, what good still would it do to actually condemn me and kick me up and excommunicate me if that was the case. That's our, our policy is to believe women. Um, and we've never had a woman lie to us, which is really pretty spectacular in seven years of ministry. Yeah. But my thinking is if she's not being honest, she still needs help. Like exactly. if, if somebody can come up, if somebody can exactly. come up with some sort of like intricate lie that her husband is abusing her, then she, there's still something really <laughs> wrong, in, right? Like, and I should exactly. still love her and exactly. help her, you know? So there, you know, where there's, there's gotta be compassion, but you know, that kind of condemnation, that is never, that's, that's not in God's character. And I have mm. a very similar story to yours, Natalie. And I think, I think any woman who is a godly woman like you is not going to just pick up and walk away from a marriage willy nilly because she's just not happy or whatever with nine kids with nine children, because we love Jesus and we want to obey him. So that decision for me was the most agonizing decision I've ever made. Yes. I took my four children and left Europe and came back here with a hundred euros in my pocket and zero support. That's how bad it was. Yeah. And I still was told that I was misled, that I was confused, that I don't know what the truth is, you know, all of those same things. And so, so when we talk to women who come to us and say, I think I'm being abused or women who are, maybe they they're, they're through the divorce and they're trying to rebuild their lives and they don't know what to do and they don't trust themselves. We, we, pointedly do not tell them what to do. 
We mm-hmm. ask them, what is God telling you? Because she needs to begin to trust the Holy Spirit's work in her life. You've heard mm-hmm. us say this a thousand times. You have a sound mind. God has given you a sound mind. The Holy Spirit lives in you and he will lead you. Um, be easy to just tell her what we think is best for her, you know, but pastors and ministers, lay people, people, helpers who are listening, let her make the decision, companion her, draw out from her what she feels God might be telling her and then affirm it. I mean, I've never really talked to a Christian who says something super crazy off the wall, sinful that she feels God is telling her to do. That hasn't happened. I'm sure that's out there. You know, I'm sure. (laughs) Right. Yeah. There's kind of this thinking that, oh, well, if we, if we, if we uh, support a woman, you know, then another woman's going to come along and say that God's telling her to, you know, to, I don't, I don't know. I can't. That sounds so archaic. That's like right. Queen Esther. They're like, oh no, she's not Queen Esther, but the, the one, the. Oh, um, Vashti. 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 Yeah. Oh, yeah. we have to make an example of her, you know, like that. What are we, you know, in Syria, Phoenicia? I don't even know what they were. <laughs> <laughs> well, this has been a problem throughout all of history. We always want to like exaggerate. Yeah. If we don't get our way, then we're going to exaggerate and say, oh, if you get your way, then this horrible, horrible thing is going to happen. So, yeah. Right. Is this content resonating with you? I've written a book for women of faith and destructive relationships called Is It Me? Making Sense of Your Confusing Marriage a Christian woman's guide to hidden emotional and spiritual abuse. You can actually read reviews and find out more about my book on amazon.com. It comes in paperback, Kindle, and audible formats. I've also got a website specifically focused on helping women of faith find hope and healing. It's called flyingfreenow.com. I'll even give you the first three chapters of my book free if you want to hop on my mailing list at the top of my website. Those three chapters are going to help you figure out if your relationship is normal or destructive. Now, let's get back to our episode. Um, can you talk, you mentioned the word companioning, and we were talking about that a little bit before the podcast. Tell, tell us what yeah. that word means to you. Well, it is one of our core values that Give Her Wings. Um, we have three core values, um, dignity, companioning, and um, a culture of storytelling. Um, the storytelling is mainly to give our mamas, we call them our mamas, <laughs> to give women a voice, to be able to share their story and just let them share it. You know, it could be all over the place. Um, it could be succinct. It could have a beginning, middle and an end. It may never end. You know, it might they might not even know what the end is yet. Um, so that's really important. And we, um, we include that in our Giver Wings Academies. We, we include survivor stories so that these women can have a voice. It's very powerful. So lots of storytelling. Um, and then um, dignity. And that's just upholding all the, the, um, the, the image of God in every person that we meet and recognizing that and giving everybody that dignity. We don't treat people like anything to be used or an asset or, you know, anything like that. We want them to have dignity, but companioning is my favorite part of what we do. Um, because that's very different than counseling. It kind of lets, uh, believers off the hook as far as, Oh, I don't know what to say. And I'm so afraid I'll say the wrong thing. Um, but we talk a lot about companionship among our team members. And really what that is, is saying you, my friend and sister are walking through a very dark, tangled, forest. And I want to take your hand and walk through it with you. So we can't fix that forest. We can't fix the problems. Um, we do our best to help financially, you know, as you know, cause we are a nonprofit and we help women financially, but the best thing that we can do is ask questions, listen to their story, draw out what is hurting them the most. So when, so when we talk, you know, when I, when I do my counseling and with my pastoral counseling, I will ask, you know, if you were to say, Natalie, to me, I am so scared. I would say, what are you most scared of? And, and let's talk about that. And all of a sudden you're not alone anymore because you have a companion 
who hears your greatest fear, I'm not going to judge you on being afraid of that. I'm not going to try to fix it and say, well, you know, um, if you were a stronger Christian, then you wouldn't be afraid, you know, because Mm -hmm. Jesus was afraid. Fear is a thing. Um, So companioning is holding her hand and walking with her with proper boundaries, of course, Um, not overdoing it, not giving in to compassion fatigue, not feeling like it's our job and responsibility to fix everything, but just being there. Yeah. And so that, you know, if there are any pastors listening, which I hope there are, that's the best thing that you can do for a woman who is saying she's being abused. You don't have to panic on the inside. You don't have to, you know, hear every single angle of the story from every person involved in her life. God has called us to compassion and he's called us to love. And listening to her is one of the greatest act of, acts of love that you can give because chances are she hasn't had a voice in a very long time. Mm-hmm. And she might not even know how to express herself. Right. Well, let's, let's close by telling, talking about some of the things, some of the ways that they can get help as far as training and education. And we'll start by talking about your new academy, which filled up really fast this last <laughs> fall and will be opening again in January. March. 2000, oh, I'm sorry. March of 2020. Mm-hmm. Oh my goodness. That's, that's a long time from now. So, um, <laughs> but why don't you talk about that a little bit? And I'm going to actually, we're going to actually have Megan back again at early next year to talk again about this in more detail, but just give an overview and then also let them know where they can go to sign up to get on the waiting list. So they can be one of the first people to hop on board next time it opens. So thank you for bringing that up because we are really excited about Give Her Wings Academy, Natalie. It just really took off. Um, We decided to keep each cohort at 150 people. We developed it because we recognized and recognized um, that pastors don't know what to do. Ministers don't know what to do. And, And there are so many women who have a heart for helping other women. There are so many men who have a heart for helping um, and women who've been abused. And again, I do want to point out that men are also abused. We just happen to, our ministry just happens to be directed toward women because that's what we are and who we know. So um, there are other resources for men out there, but Giver Wings Academy, um, we started our pilot group five months ago and we have, we have male pastors on there. We have female pastors on there. We have um, survivors on there. We have um, um, just people who feel called and feel led to minister to this marginalized group of people, those who are victims of abuse. And it got more and more comprehensive. So it's actually a year long certification process and we cover everything. So we have expert advocates and pastors and we have theologians and authors and um you know, the whole gamut. And we frame it all in a really healthy theology. Um, thanks to Jimmy Hinton, who just was really invaluable. We have Joseph Pope, we have Natalie, we have Leslie Vernick, um, just a whole bunch of amazing, amazing people, um, men and women who provide these lectures. The Academy is $25 a month, which is incredibly affordable. Um, and all of the proceeds go toward helping victims of abuse um, on, on, on our nonprofit side. So it's kind of a win-win because you earn a certification with a lot of experts, but you're also helping victims of abuse as you're doing it. Um, so that's kind of my favorite part of the whole academy is that it, it, it funnels that money into the nonprofit and we're able to help more women financially who have found themselves with little to no recourse, just really in destitute situations and can't find support anywhere else. So um, it's exciting and it's been really, really, it's, I've learned so much um, as I've done this academy. Um, I've learned so much about theology. I've learned practical tips. I've learned about legal options. Um, I've learned about how to help children whose um, parents are going through a divorce or who have been, um, abuse themselves. I've learned about um, secondary trauma. I've learned about trauma bonding. I've learned about sociopaths. I've learned about um, 
parental alienation. I mean, I could go on and on. Yeah. It is a wonderful program. Yeah. Well, and here, here's the thing. Abuse is extraordinarily complex. There are so many different layers to abuse. And when I, I, I remember the church that uh, excommunicated me, they had a person come in <clears throat> and train them one weekend in domestic violence issues, a one weekend <laughs> training. And, and <laughs> you can't even, I mean, if you could That's picture, nice. yeah. no, I know if you could picture abuse as being like a, uh, like a, what, what are those? An iceberg. That's like mm-hmm. a snowflake on the top yeah. of an iceberg. You know, it's just, that's just not going to cut it. You, uh, the thing I love about the Academy is that it, you know, when we learn, we learn best by hearing things over and over again in different ways from different perspectives. And we learn from hearing stories too. So I love that the Academy is not just experts, but you're getting stories from real people and you're getting it spread out in small doses over an entire year. So that by the time you're done, you not only have been introduced to all of these different advocates, which by the way, these advocates and these resources, (coughs) excuse me, they all have their own resources. So if you wanted to dig in deeper, um, into like sex abuse in church, you know, you could follow up with Jimmy Hinton. If you wanted to, um, if you wanted to dig in deeper with, um, tra- the whole trauma thing or with dealing with children, you could, you know, uh, access you all of that. So on every single lecture is a lengthy list of resources, oh, suggested wow. reading, reading materials, journaling questions, and, um, and also, Natalie, I forgot to tell you this, but we do role playing as well. So what do you do if a woman comes to you and says, I don't know if this is abuse, but my husband smacked my child last night, you know, like, what do you say? So we actually like do that as presentations for the people who take the academy because sometimes you just need the words, you know? Yes. Yes. Oh, and also <laughs> I'm getting excited. I know I'm getting louder and more excited. (laughs) Um, We we are creating a package for churches so that a whole church team or a whole group of people who want to learn about domestic violence can take a faith-based certification course so that they can bring that into their churches. That is so wonderful. And then People who, people like me, if we're looking for a safe church, you're going to, are you going to have a database too eventually of churches that are certified? Thank you for, for reminding me of that. So any minister who goes through the certification process and completes it, that person's church will be added to our database on our website, which of course we would share with you in Flying Free of a safe place to go a church that understands abuse, a church where you won't be condemned for having the courage to step out of an abusive situation. Beautiful. Well, (laughs) Megan, we're going to wrap this up. Thank you so much for giving your... Do you want the link really quickly here? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Save the link. Okay, so it's giveherwingsacademy.mykajabi, K-A-J-A-B-I.com. Okay, and I will put that link in the show notes as well. All right, let's 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 take two. Thank you so much for being on the Flying Free Podcast, Megan. And for the rest of you, until next time, fly free.